time where we ought not be praising the Lord. Every day, in every way, we ought to give thanks to God, for he has done great things. Amen. Amen. Let me direct your attention to Psalms 137. Psalms 137. Beginning at the first verse. You may remember this passage, for it holds great meaning to people who have been in bondage and been set free. You will remember the words, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered <coughs> Zion. There on the poplars we hung our hearts. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land. We want to speak from the subject this morning, a community response to injustice. A community response to injustice. Dr. John Henri Clark said the events which transpired 5,000 years ago Five years ago, or five minutes ago, have determined what will happen five minutes from now, five years from now, or five thousand years from now. All history is a current event. Yeah. And I don't think you would argue with me when I say in remembrance <coughs> that few events have galvanized the fight for racial justice in America more than the death of Emmett Till. And I pray that we never forget the role of his story in our larger story. And I tell it often, and I tell it frequently, that each generation may be reminded that the struggle continues. Yeah. So have you ever sent a loved one on vacation, had them return to you in a pine box, so horribly battered and waterlogged that someone needs to tell you this sickening sight is your son, lynched. These are the words of Mamie Teal Bradley Mobley, the mother of Emmett Teal. In August 1955, Emmett, 14-year-old, bright and handsome boy, went to visit relatives near Money, Mississippi. Emmett had experienced segregation in his, in his hometown of Chicago, but he was unaccustomed to the severe segregation he encountered in Mississippi. He is said to have either whistled or made a flirtatious comment to Carolyn Bryant, the wife of a local store owner, while in a store. A few days later, two men came to the cabin of Mose Wright, Emmett's uncle, in the middle of the night. Roy Bryant, the owner of the store, and J.W. Milam, his brother-in-law, drove off with Emmett. Three days later, Emmett Till's body was found in the Tallahatchie River. One eye was gouged out, and his crushed-in head had a bullet in it. The corpse was nearly unrecognizable. Mose Wright could only positively identify the body as Emmett because he was wearing an initialed ring. Bryant and Milam were arrested for kidnapping even before Emmett's body was found. The Emmett Till case quickly attracted national attention. Mamie Bradley, Emmett's mother, 
asked that the body be shipped back to Chicago. When it arrived, she inspected it carefully to ensure that it really was her son. Then she insisted on an open casket funeral so that all the world could see what they did to my son. Over four days, thousands of people saw Emmett's body. Many more blacks across the country who might not have otherwise heard of the case were shocked by pictures that appeared in Jet Magazine. These pictures moved blacks in a way that nothing else had. When the Cleveland Call and Post polled major black radio preachers around the country, it found that five of every six were preaching about Emmett Till, and half of them were demanding that something be done in Mississippi now. The two men went on trial in a segregated courthouse in Sumner, Mississippi, on September 19, 1955. In the end, defense attorney John C. Whitten told the jurors in his closing statement, now this is an all-white jury, he said to them, your fathers will turn over in their graves if Milam and Bryant are found guilty. And I'm sure that every last Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to free these men in the face of that outside pressure. Hmm, I wonder what the lawyer told the grand jury in Missouri. The jurors listened to him. They deliberated for just over an hour, then returned a not guilty verdict on September 23rd, the 166th anniversary of the signing of the Bill of Rights. The jury foreman later explained, I feel the state, this is why they didn't convict, I feel the state failed to prove the identity of the body. Not that they didn't kill him, but that that wasn't him. You can't tell me that's him because he's unrecognizable. In Mamie Bradley Mobley's words, Two months ago, I had a nice apartment in Chicago. I had a good job. I had a son. When something happened to the Negroes in the South, I said, that's their business, not mine. Now I know how wrong I was. The murder of my son has shown me that what happens to any of us anywhere in the world had better be the business of us all. Amen. Lord have mercy. Yeah, mercy. Trayvon Martin remains a case in point. It seems as if this evil empire is hoping that we as a people will get amnesia and lose interest in his case. I can imagine George Zimmerman stalking one of my sons in the rain. I can see EJ walking back from the 7-Eleven or Circle K eating Skittles and talking with his girlfriend on the phone. I can see him turn and notice a car trailing him slowly. Then a bulky, evil-looking white man gets out the car and asks what he's doing in that neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As if in the 21st century there are still neighborhoods where black people are unwelcome. Amen. My son is 23 cocky, self-willed, he might respond, why is that your business? And continue walking. The man may confront EJ, get all up in his face, and start a fight. Well, being my son, EJ will defend himself, because that's a natural response to bullying, only to be outmanned by a bullet wound to the chest. The aggressor, or George Zimmerman, if you will, is battered and bruised, of course, because of EJ's defense. But George is alive. Then the police show up and allow this George Zimmerman to go free without any charges. Face, uh, face forward, the community of blacks would hear about it, they would protest and perhaps the DA would arrest the man.
Perhaps a trial would be held. But then the man exclaimed, not guilty. Yet EJ would still be dead. And our family would be heartbroken, would be angry, would have rage seething on the inside. George Zimmerman, not guilty of the murder of Trayvon Martin, and he's still free somewhere to kill again. Darren Wilkes, no need for a trial because a police officer is authorized to kill any black man on sight. Michael Brown's brutal death by choking was ruled justified, forced by a New York grand jury. Justice again has been delayed. And without toil and perseverance on the part of good black folks, Christian people, it will happen over and over again. So the families of Trayvon and Eric and Michael have now joined Emmett's mother and countless other mothers whose sons and daughters have been placed in body bags due to racism, violence, and hatred. It's at these times that I like to go back and watch the movie A Time to Kill, starring Samuel Jackson, just to get me some perspective, help me get through these types of events. Because we as a people, we're in solidarity this morning. We're in black, we are black, and we cannot afford to forget the struggle for justice, freedom, and citizenship that our ancestors paid for us to be here. A few minutes from now, you're going to hear a little bit about church history. Our ancestors suffered, put pennies together, struggled to build a church where black folks could not only pray and shout, but where they could come together and collaborate strategize, come up with ways away from the media to get over certain injustices in the world. Now look at our text this morning. For well, these are people who have just been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonian exile is the backdrop for this song. In 587, BCE, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and carried many of the Judean elite, the smartest and strongest, into captivity. Whether you know it or not, that's who's in jail right now. Some of our brightest children have been unjustly incarcerated. And, and, and memory now, because that's what they're doing, memory is a major theme in this text, the passage examines the complex and painful process of remembering. Some of us don't want to remember. I've heard people say, I don't want to hear anymore about slavery days and Jim Crow. I'm tired of hearing about that. Because we're tired of hearing about it, history just keeps repeating itself. The psalm is divided into three parts, verse 1 through 4 verse 5 through 6, verse 7 through 9. In each stanza, a form of the Hebrew verb to remember occurs. It occurs in verse 1, in verse 6, and in verse 7. And so I believe that our response to these injustices must be rooted in a communal remembering. We can't do it alone. It is a message to black folks of the diaspora, the survivors of the Middle Passage, slavery, and Jim Crow to remember. It is a message of remembering to black folk that they need to adhere to because if we don't remember, we will repeat the same failures of the past. It is a message to remember. We constantly seem to have to prove that we are not three-fifths of a human being. Now it's been removed from the Constitution. We have 
our civil liberties, but in the eyes of those who refuse to accept our presence in this country, we are still less than even their past. We are still viewed as a burden, as Langston Hughes would say. I am the American heart, bread, the rock upon which Jonestown stomps its toe. And they've been stomping their toe ever since we got here. Because they refuse to acknowledge that we too are made in the image likeness of God. So remember these three responses in this passage. I want to go over them briefly. I'm going to be done. But remember that when we look back over the road we have come, we have three different responses. One of anguish, one of accountability, and one of anger. Verse 1 through 4 shows us the anguish in the entire community. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. And there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willow, there we hung our hearts. For there our captors asked us for song, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. The only church call for peace, sing and shout, but don't do anything else. We responded as a community, how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Now notice in this, these four passages, the prevalence of first person plural language, we, in these verses. Remembering the former greatness of Zion and the destruction of the Lord's temple by the foreign power of Nebuchadnezzar, this community adopts a posture of mourning, of sinning, and the taunts of the imperial captors increase their anger. Because when people think they have power over you, they will bully you, intimidate you, and dare you to respond any other way other than sitting beneath them in silence. They taunt the children of Israel and said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Now this is a vicious request because they understand those people's hearts have been broken, that once again they have been oppressed. Once again it seems as if their God is not able to protect them. Once again it seems that no matter how much uh, they go through, there's always another struggle. We can identify that even when we come to church, we don't feel like singing every Sunday morning because of the oppression that we felt all week long. Our heads are bowed down. And the devil says to us, why aren't you singing this morning? I can't hear you. Folks say, I'm tired of singing hymns. Because the hymns help us to remember what the Lord has done for us. Let's sing some upbeat music. Let's get some contemporary music that just talks about the praise, the praise, the praise. But then when they run into a struggle, they're going to need some lead me, guide me. Yes, sir. They're going to need some pass me, not O gentle Savior. They're going to need some songs to help them form words that express other than what they feel, but that help them express who God is in their struggle. Yeah. In verse 5 and 6, this remembering assumes a more personal dimension. Highlights the anger caused by oppression. These folks are mad. They're upset. And the psalmist says, in verse 5 and 6, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. In other words, they're angry that Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed their livelihood. And we ought to be 
be angry yeah. that our sons and daughters are being incarcerated, that our livelihood is being taken away through a lack of jobs and a lack of benefits. We ought to be angry when we understand that businesses can get welfare, or, or let, let me change that, tax breaks. We ought to be upset that when we give tax breaks to the companies that are coming in to pay our, our, our children minimum wage who've been already to, to college and graduated and they still can't find a job that employs them in the manner that they have strived to improve themselves for a better life. We ought to be angry. Yeah. And so notice how this shift from we to I in these two verses becomes singular, it becomes personal, it becomes not we mad, but I'm mad. I'm angry. I need an outlet for my anger. And he says, remember, I'm going to remember, I'm going to remember where God is. And when I remember where God is, though it is painful, though it makes me upset, I know that there is still hope. I know that there is still light in the midst of darkness. I know, based on my history, that the Lord will make a way somehow. Yeah, yeah. That gives me some peace. It keeps me from engaging in some unthinkable act. Because when you don't remember that God delivers, you will try to take matters in your own hand. You will raise the standard. You will institute your own vindication. But when you remember that God delivered us from slavery, when you remember that God delivered us from Jim Crow, yeah, we marched. But while we were marching, there were angels on the case. Yeah. While we were telling the world that we will be free, God was behind the scenes working things out for us, and he's behind the scenes right now. Yes, yes, yes amen. Now, I believe this writer of this song probably was a musician. Uh, a musician has got a whole range of emotions that they go through in music and in lyrics and and this sounds just like somebody is almost uh, uh, bipolar because of the stress and because of the pain and because of the anguish of all that mental uh, problems that they're going through. Because when you have defeated God, who are they going to run to? These people thought that God had been defeated because in Israel, Israel knew God as sovereign over everything. And if the Babylonians came in and burned their temple and took them away from their city, certainly their God must be greater than the God Yahweh. And when your God has been defeated, it's hard to praise. So you can understand, they weren't just talking about their condition, they were talking about their spirituality. How can we sing the Lord's song when God has been defeated? How can we tell you how awesome God is when our whole world has been turned upside down? How can we come to church and worship and praise this God who would allow such injustice to go on in the world? Where is this God? They sat down by the river, mad but remembering. Something about remembering. If you remember long enough, there's some light going to come to you. If you remember long enough, there's going to be a bright spot in your remembering. If you remember long enough, you're going to hear from heaven. Can you hear the pain in our ancestors who said, before I be a slave, I'll be resting in my grave and go home with my Lord? and be free. That's, that's the same cry. I can't breathe. That's the same cry that's going on in Ferguson. No justice. No peace. That's what the youngsters are saying about 
tearing down the businesses in their community because to them it's not their community. It's the community of those who have and of those who they have been placed over them as a police force to oppress them and to harass them and make them feel like a motherless child. How can they burn stores that are supposed to provide for them because those stores are not standing up for them? How can a business person keep taking from the community and then when something happens in the community, they don't stand up for the citizen that support the business? So to them, that's, that, that business doesn't mean anything. It's, they don't own it. They don't own the homes they live in. They're renting from people who allow oppression to overwhelm them. So in their eyes, they're not doing anything wrong. They're not hurting anybody. They're not hurting their community because they have no stake in the community. They're not even heard from in their community. They have no voice, but people are listening now. Tear it down. Tear it down. Down to its foundation. That's what it says in verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem fall. They didn't say, let us hold hands. They said, God, burn it up. Just like they burn us up. Take them down. Just like they took us down. Can you believe people of God will be saying things like that in the Bible? <laughs> that we read? They actually pray for God to retaliate and to do it violently because of their pain. Yeah, yeah. Amen. You guys don't, don't run from your pain. The Bible said be angry and sin not. You got to go through, you got to process your pain. Amen? Amen. Amen. Then, verse 7 begins... Again, I say, not with a command from God, but to God. The psalmist boldly demands that God not get amnesia. They're saying to God, God, you remember. You promised to protect us. You promised that if we live for you, you would be our rear guard. Yes. Our shield and buckler. You promised you would protect our children and our children's children. We're your children. You called us. We didn't call you. Don't get amnesia, God, about who you are. Because they believe God must have just, must have just slipped his mind to allow the Babylonian gods to come in and provide all that destruction. And so he is remembering now that God could have if God desired, acted on their behalf. They forgot all their sin now. Discount that. But they're remembering that God is still able. And then the psalmist harbors these disturbing fantasies of violence against Babylon. O daughter of Babylon, verse 8, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. These people are getting angry. They're almost throwing rocks in windows, burning police cars. They're upset. Now, interpreters of these last two verses I read, verse 8 and 9, they, they denounce the violence in this text. I'm not. They do that. They can do that in the commentary. But I think there's a time when you, you have to raise up every now and then. But, but, but by failing to engage these troubling verses, I think preachers forfeit an opportunity to examine the dynamics of pain and imperial oppression. That's why in this country, in domestic violence cases, the woman goes to jail mm. for killing her husband who was beating her up. So that intimidates women to stay in those situations or to try to run away because if they respond to those actions, they're the ones that's going to jail. It is the mindset of America that men are in charge. Amen. Man is the king of his castle. And everything in the castle submits to the man. Amen. All right, likes. Don't pack your bag yet. 
I'm almost done. <laughs> but we have to know that we live in a violent world. This world is evil, it is violent, and we've got to live in it as Christians. And that's not an easy task. Rage, what produces our children. Tupac Shakur, urban poet. They, 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 they're tired, they, they're fed up, and we've got to hear their voices. We've got to advise them, because it's just a raw articulation of pain. That's all the rock in the window means. It means we're hurting. We're tired, and we're frustrated. So, I got to close here. Let me give you a couple of quotes to think about this week. James Stanley, in one of his uh, books on uh, meditation, wrote this. He said, and this applies to us, I believe. He says, a rattlesnake, a rattlesnake if cornered, will sometimes become so angry, it will bite itself. I'm going to say that again. A rattlesnake, if cornered, will sometimes become so angry, it will bite itself. That is exactly what the harboring of hate and resentment against others is, a biting of oneself. We think that we are harming others in holding these fights and hate, but the deeper harm is to ourselves. And that's why black on black crime is happening. Because our children have become so angry, they started biting each other. Let me give you another quote, Dr. King. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate, violence multiplies violence, and toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. The chain reaction of evil, hate, begetting hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken, or we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. So we have to remember today. We've got to remember where we have come from. We've got to remember how we made it over. We've got to remember that it was in the day that we told our children who God is. Yeah. It is the day that we would stop a child that we saw misbehaving in public. It was a day where we were a community. It was a day where I could speak to your child without you shooting me. It was a day and a time where I could call you up and tell you that your child was misbehaving and you would do something about it. But today is not that day. Today, if you say anything to anyone's child, that before they even hear the case, they're ready to curse you out. So we cower in fear of speaking to our own children. Fear of speaking to our own community. Because our children have no foundation in God. They don't know who God is. And because they don't know who God is, they call themselves little gods. And so they go about doing whatever it is they want to do, whatever they want to do it. They have all the options. Well, my child don't want to participate. My child, uh, I'll say they can't learn. My child, my child, my child. Yes, that's your child. And unless you put some standards in front of your child, they are going to follow the way of the scorner of God. And when they do that, they are going to put themselves in position where they're going to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, and something tragic may happen to them because they don't know God, they don't know boundaries, they don't know love, they don't know what justice even looks like. They have no foundation. So how can the church go about just singing and shouting and wanting the preacher to rev it up, wanting the preacher to rap back, rub his head, Throw his leg up. 
Give me that good old ah! <laughs> Why he's hollering? Our children are dying. Why he's hollering? <coughs> Nobody's learning anything. Our children are sitting there texting because if they want to show, they'll go to the club. They're sitting there talking to each other because they're not learning anything. And when they leave church, they go out there with their friends. And then they get educated on the streets. When they need to be educated on the Lord. Amen. We need to remember that it was a strong foundation in our families of God and church. And I didn't like church. The mama didn't ask me if I liked it. I didn't want to hear that preacher preach for no hour. Mama didn't ask me if I liked it. I was a boy, put your clothes on, us going to church. And if I even thought about saying something, daddy would get together straight. And I knew better. Put my clothes on and run on down to Sunday school. That didn't mean I had the best Sunday school teacher. Matter of fact, a couple of them were boring. Didn't think I learned anything. But one thing I do know, I know who God is. One thing I do know, I know right from wrong. One thing I do know, that there is an accountability system that you reap what you sow. Amen. I do know that if I go through injustice in this life, I've got a reward in the next life because God's going to pay them back. Amen. Because God even says in the New Testament, Romans 12, 21, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy don't like it, the Bible says feel. If your enemy don't like it, the Bible says give him some water to drink. If your enemy is acting out of character, the Bible says love him anyway. Why? Because in so doing, you are heaping coals of fire on their head. Yeah. What do you mean, Reverend? I mean, when you bless somebody that's mistreating you, it's hard for them to go to sleep. Because their conscience is bothering them. And every day that you bless them, every time Dr. King marched in the streets and they spat on us and beat us, white folks got a conscience. And we were called the conscience of the nation. That was our title. In other words, when black folks stood strong in their God, things changed. Yeah. We don't we don't remember that. We wandered, we strayed so far from God. Look how empty this church is. Go down the road, it's about as empty too. Go down there, got plenty of cars, they were one in each car. It's about empty too. Go to the mega churches with the twenty thousand, ain't got fifteen hundred in there. We wandered so far away from our biblical roots until we don't know that this God that we serve is still able yes. to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything we could ever ask or think. Yes. So I ask you today to just remember, just remember how far the Lord has brought us. And I believe you are saying he didn't bring me this far to leave me now. I believe you'll come to understand that God is up to something. My bishop said yesterday a lot of this injustice is because we voted for a black president. Mm -hmm. And there's consequences to that. They can't get to him, so they get to us. Can't kill the head, so they're working on the feet. We may have to endure some injustice, <coughs> but ain't God good? Yes. He said, I'll give you double for all your trouble. Yes. He said, I'll restore everything that the canker worm has stolen. Yes, yes. He said, I'll renew your youth as an eagle. Yes. He says, I'll redeem your life from destruction. He says, I'll heal you from all your diseases. He says, I won't regard or deal with you according to your sins. Why, God? Because I know what you got to deal with. And any sane human being going to sin a little bit <coughs> with the stuff we go through. You ain't gonna slip and cuss. You go 
superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then, as Dr. Hill would say, you got to get emphatic with some things. And I know you don't believe in it, but even your Bible show you how Jesus cussed. They just wrote it pretty because King James didn't want them cuss words. Mm -hmm. He called them both whitewashed tombs. Yeah. There was not pretty language in his day. When he called them rotten and sepulchral and all that, that wasn't good language in his day. But he got angry with them for their injustice and called it the way he saw it. So when you read Matthew 23, just remember they changed the language yeah. to protect the innocent. So that way, when you cuss, you would think that you were sinning, and then you know. You feel bad. But every now and then, you have to get folks told. In Jesus' name. <laughs> In Jesus' name, you got to get the devil off you. Every now and then, you got to call it like you see it. That's the kind of God we serve. This should be our response to injustice. We should be gathering folks in the house of God, yeah. teaching them about who God is yeah. and who they are as God's children. Because we're not just wearing black, we are black. Because yeah. black is beautiful, perfect in every way. God made us. God didn't make no joke. Matter of fact, everything on this planet comes from black. Amen. Every color known to man comes from black. Don't you ever let folks tell you that you three fifths of a human being. Don't ever, don't ever listen to that crazy justice of the Supreme Court <coughs> who said that the black man has no rights, that a white man is bound to respect. You get your respect by the way you relate to yourself and to God. And white folks will respect you as well. Amen. Amen. Grow up loving the church, little boy. Remember how you used to run and play. Let's stand to our feet.